Now we turn to Acts chapter 17. Acts chapter 17. A typical little slice of evangelism in the days of the New Testament and some of the very mixed reactions that they had when they preached in those days. And it describes the travels of Paul and Silas. And when they had passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica where there was a synagogue of the Jews and Paul went in as was his custom and for three weeks he argued with them from the scriptures explaining and proving that it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and rise from the dead and saying this Jesus whom I proclaim to you is the Christ and some of them were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas as did a great many of the devout Greeks and not a few of the leading women. But the Jews were jealous, and taking some wicked fellows of the rabble, they gathered a crowd, set the city in an uproar, and attacked the house of Jason, seeking to bring them out to the people. And when they could not find them, they dragged Jason and some of the brethren before the city authorities, crying, These men who have turned the world upside down have come here also. Of course, you'll realize that's how it looked to them. But then when you're walking around on your head, you don't see things the right way. They were really turning the world right way up. And Jason has received them, and they are all acting against the decrees of Caesar, saying that there is another king, Jesus. And the people in the city authorities were disturbed when they heard this. And when they had taken security from Jason and the rest, they let them go. The brethren immediately sent Paul and Silas away by night to Berea. And when they arrived, they went into the Jewish synagogue. Now these Jews were more noble than those in Thessalonica, for they received the word with all eagerness, examining the scriptures daily to see if these things were so. What an encouragement it is to a preacher when people go home to check what he says in the Bible. That's what I'd like you to do. And if it's not there, don't believe it. Many of them therefore believed, with not a few Greek women of high standing as well as men. But when the Jews of Thessalonica learned that the word of God was proclaimed by Paul at Berea also, they came there too, stirring up and inciting the crowds. Then the brethren immediately sent Paul off on his way to the sea. But Silas and Timothy remained there. Those who conducted Paul brought him as far as Athens, and receiving a command for si Silas and Timothy to come to him as soon as possible, they departed. Now while Paul was waiting for them at Athens, his spirit was provoked within him, as he saw that the city was full of idols. So he argued in the synagogue with the Jews and the devout persons, and in the marketplace every day with those who chanced to be there. Some also of the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers met him, and some said, what would this babbler say? Others said, he seems to be a preacher of foreign divinities, because he preached Jesus and the resurrection. And they took hold of him and brought him to the Areopagus, saying, may we know what this new teaching is which you present? For you bring some strange things to our ears. We wish to know, therefore, what these things mean. Now all the Athenians and the foreigners who lived there spent their time in nothing except telling or hearing something new. So Paul, standing in the middle of the Areopagus, said, Men of Athens, I perceive that in every way you are very religious. For as I passed along and observed the objects of your worship, I found also an altar with this inscription, To an unknown God. What therefore you worship as unknown, this I proclaim to you, the God who made the world and everything in it, being Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in shrines made by men, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all men life and breath and everything. And he made from one every nation of men to live on all the face of the earth, having determined allotted periods and the boundaries of their habitation, that they should seek God in the hope that they might feel after him and find him. Yet he is not far from each one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being, as even some of your poets have said, 
for we are indeed his offspring. Being then God's offspring, we ought not to think that the deity is like gold or silver or stone, a representation of the art and imagination of men. The times of ignorance God overlooked. But now he commands all men everywhere to repent, because he has fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed. And of this he has given assurance to all men by raising him from the dead. Now when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked. But others said, we will hear you again about this. So Paul went out from among them, but some men joined him and believed. Among them Dionysius the Areopagite and a woman named Demaris and others with them. After this he left Athens and went to Corinth. It was in the month of November 1699, just a few weeks before the 18th century opened, that Master Gulliver was wrecked on the land of Lilliput. And Gulliver's Travels was published. It was written by Jonathan Swift, an Irishman who tried to settle many times in England, failed to do so, and finally died insane in Dublin. But before his mind left him, he wrote Gulliver's Travels, and it is a savage attack on English society at the beginning of the 18th century. It's not a children's book. And if you want to know what England was like at the beginning of the hundred years we're considering tonight, read that book. A few years later, Robinson Crusoe found his shipwrecked island or was shipwrecked and found his island. And it seems as if there was a craze at that time to get out of England. History repeats itself. But there was a desire to get away from English society. And Robinson Crusoe seems much happier on his desert island than when he comes back to England in the year 1715. These two books introduce the fact that we must talk about before we look at the church, and that is that England was going to pieces. Socially, England was in a bad way. And we must ask why, what caused it? Can I sum up what I want to say tonight in a rather simple and maybe crude way by saying that man was turning on the cold tap and God was turning on the hot tap through the 18th century. And man was turning on the cold tap of what we call rationalism, the intellect, by itself, reason. And God was turning on the hot tap of what we call revivalism and calling some great men to preach the gospel and to lift the temperature of English society. Now, I want to speak for the first ten minutes or so about the cold tap. And for that reason, it's not going to be very lively and not very interesting. But if you get this kind of deadness creeping over you by quarter past seven, that's precisely what was creeping over English society. People were going spiritually dead. And the reason is their beliefs were going in the wrong direction and therefore their behavior went in the wrong direction. And one of the lessons we learn from the 18th century is this, a man's beliefs affect his behavior. What a man thinks in his heart, so he will be in his outward life. As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. And that might be our text for tonight. Well, what kind of beliefs were cooling religion? What kind of beliefs were killing English society at the beginning of the 18th century? Well, of course, it was partly the influence of science. There had been many wonderful discoveries. Copernicus had discovered, or at least had said, that the planets revolved around the sun and not the earth. And Galileo, with his telescope, had discovered that this was in fact so. Isaac Newton was still discovering things about apples and greater laws illustrated thereby, and was propounding the law of gravity. But above all, a man called Francis Bacon and another man called Descartes were saying this, the universe in which we live is governed by laws which can't be broken. In other words, if an apple comes off your apple tree, it must come down. That's a law of gravity. It could never be broken. And they were saying that these laws are absolutely fixed. 
and you couldn't ever alter them. Now that, of course, with one blow, sweeps out miracle and sweeps out a great deal of the things that happened in the Bible. For some of the things that happen in the Bible seem to go right against such natural laws. Furthermore, Francis Bacon said this, and you'd be amazed when I say this to realize how modern he was and how much we are indebted or influenced by him. He said, that the only things that you can say are true are the things that you can prove by observation. And that if you can't prove a thing scientifically by observation, you mustn't believe it. That you mustn't accept anything on authority. You must always test it. And if you can't prove it scientifically by observation, you needn't believe it. Now that was a tremendous step forward or backward, depending which way you look at it. But it's astonishing how the sixth former in school today says, I can't believe it unless you can prove it. I can't believe in God unless you can demonstrate him, unless uh, I can observe him. I can't believe in heaven or in a devil. You can't prove these things scientifically. Now they are just echoing what Francis Bacon was saying. And frankly, that idea kills religion dead. It's bound to. Because the one thing that you cannot prove by observation is the eternal world to which God belongs and the devil belongs and the angel belongs and all the other things that belong to religion come from. Now where does God fit in then? Did that mean that they ceased to believe in God in the 18th century? No. But they switched from a belief that we call theism to a belief that we call deism which is one step on the way to atheism. Now let me tell you what I mean quite simply. Theism is the belief that God created the world and controls it. Deism is the belief that God created it but can't control it. And atheism is the belief that he didn't create it either because there isn't a God to create. Now I could find out whether you were a deist or not by asking you whether you would ever pray about the weather. That would tell me straight away whether you believe that God controls the world is made. Now, if you believe that God created and controlled, you're a theist. And I'm a theist tonight, and the Bible is a theistic book. But in the 18th century, they said this, if the universe is governed by these hard laws and you can't break them, then God may have made them, but there's nothing he can do about it now. So there's no point in asking him to change anything and to step in and do something. You can still believe in God, but he's a God who made it long ago and then just left it running. And one of the most popular ideas propounded by a bishop was that the world is like a gigantic clock. Once you've made it, there's nothing you can do about it. Once you've made it and wound it up, it'll just go on according to its own laws, like that clock's rushing by now, round and round. There's nothing you can do. I can't say to that clock, here, just a minute, go backwards or stop. I'd love to say that, but I can't. It's a mechanism governed by its laws. And so they said God made the world and he wound it up and then he's just got to sit back. There's nothing more he can do about it. There is a God, but he can't do anything. And that is really a dead sort of God. And you wouldn't really pray much to a God who couldn't do anything, would you? And this was killing prayer. And it was killing belief in a living God who was still in control of everything. Now this sort of thinking that God was a long way off and couldn't do much crept right into the churches. It was called by different names in different churches. In the Church of England, they called it latitudinarianism. That's a wonderful word for you. In the Church of Scotland, they called it moderatism. That's typically Church of Scotland. And in the Baptists, they called it unitarianism because one of the beliefs was that God couldn't possibly have come down at Christmas. And Jesus must therefore just have been a great man. And so the faith watered down began to disappear. And all denominations suffered from this. Some Baptist churches closed down because of this kind of thinking. And worship became very formal and very dead. You just came to pay your respects to the deity who made it all, but you mustn't ever expect him to do anything. God couldn't. He's outside of what he's made. Not only did they discover, as they thought, laws of nature, there were other writers who discovered, as they thought, laws of human nature laws of society and if I just mention some names you can forget them if you wish or look them up later if you wish a man called John Locke was one of these men writing about the laws that govern society another man was Voltaire 
living in the <coughs> age of Louis XIV in France. Another was the Frenchman Rousseau and his saying, man is born free and everywhere he is in chains, is a typical Rousseau saying. And then there was the Scotsman Adam Smith, who wrote a very big tome about how to balance your imports and exports and division of labor. That's very strangely modern too. I wonder if the <coughs> chancellors we're seeing just now have read Adam Smith. And then there was Mary Wollstonecraft, and she was fighting for the divine or rights, you might almost put it, of women. She wrote a long book in which she advocated women voting, in which she advocated playing grounds at schools, uh, co-education, which was revolutionary in those days. She advocated division into secondary modern and grammar. She was quite a fighter. And many of the ideas in her book have come out. These were all trying to discover laws of society and trying to discover how society ticks. But they were all saying much the same thing, that the laws of society don't need God any more than the laws of nature. The world of nature runs without God and the world of society of human nature runs without God as well. And it was from these ideas that such things as the French Revolution came. Rousseau has been called the father of the French Revolution. Now the church tried to fight back using the weapons of the intellect. Two bishops, Bishop Butler and Bishop Barclay, really tried to preach intellectually. They really tried to match the evidence against God with evidence for God and made the whole thing a bit of an intellectual argument. Quite frankly, that never yet did much good. You can't ever argue a person into spiritual life. You might remove some of their questions and the barriers, but you'll never build a church on intellectual argument alone. And so the beliefs of the 18th century were somewhat cold and intellectual. Now this was bound to have a tremendous effect on behavior. And the 18th century was a time of turmoil, a wind of change when societies were turning upside down. In America, it was the age of the revolt of the American colonies and the founding of the United States. And Jefferson wrote Locke's philosophy, his laws of society, into the Declaration of Independence. And if you read Locke's book first and then the Declaration of Independence, you'll find where the United States got that declaration from. In France, in 1789 in July, all these new ideas burst up into the French Revolution. Now reason was going to be the goddess, and on the very altar of the Cathedral of Notre Dame in Paris, they enthroned the goddess of reason, and they said, no more God, and the reign of terror began. Later, Napoleon was to enter Rome, confiscate the papal territories, and bring the Pope as a prisoner to France. But this was the kind of turmoil. Now I'm concerned primarily with England. In America, the revolt of the colonies and the Declaration of Independence. In France, the French Revolution. What happened in England with all this turmoil of ideas? And the answer is precious little. England just drifted down while everybody else had a revolution. Again, quite typically English perhaps. But we just let things slide while other countries were being turned upside down. But slide they did. In religion, there was a hearty dislike of what was called enthusiasm. Now, we would nowadays say emotionalism. It's the same word. And people went to church and they said, no emotionalism in church, no enthusiasm, no fanaticism, just a nice intellectual talk from the vicar. But no getting excited, no getting worked up, no showing any feelings. And, of course, that's not a balanced religion. And lethargy and apathy crept into the congregations. A, a century ago, they went to fight for religion. Now they just sat in a pew and yawned. Religion, I'm afraid, became very much the religion of the upper class. The working man was poor, he was ignorant, and he was just not welcome. Bishop Butler was offered the Archbishop of Canterbury the position of being Archbishop of Canterbury, and Bishop Butler said, it's too late for me to save a dying church. It will have disappeared in my lifetime. That was the state of the church. And where the spiritual state is like that, the moral state will be worse. Do you know, if you wanted to spend an afternoon out in the 18th century, you got your family together and you went up to Tyburn, now known as Hyde Park Corner, near Marble Arch, and there, if you look around Marble Arch today, you'll see a triangle in the road, embedded, a triangle of stones. And there on that triangle, there was a gallows, 
And you went there and took a picnic and you watched people being hung, which was great fun. Children, women, men, you could be hung for stealing five shillings worth of goods or a shilling in money. And if you wanted amusement, you went to Tyburn, to Hyde Park Corner, not to hear the speakers, but to watch the hangings. If you wanted another amusement, you went to a cockpit and you saw the cockfighting. And of course, the quickest way out of London and the other industrial areas was the public house. And drink was cheap. And the advertisements hanging in the lanes of London just simply read, drunk for a penny, dead drunk for tuppence, free straw to lie on. Now, I know that a penny was a penny in those days, and tuppence was tuppence, but this, of course, led to the most appalling abuses. Not only was there heavy drinking and heavy gambling, there was heavy fighting. And if you want to study the social life of England as it became during this dead, cold, intellectual religious period, then read a book like Fielding's Tom Jones. Isn't it interesting that that's just been made into a film again? And the whole story is coming up again, and the wheels are turning. But Tom Jones is a typical book of the immorality of those days. Or study Hogarth's paintings, the cartoons of the Rake's Progress. You'll see it there. Or read Boswell's Life of Johnson, if you want to see a taste of higher society. But this is the 18th century. One man writing at the time summed it all up by saying this. Decay in religion, licentiousness in morals, public corruption and profaneness of language. That was England in the first 30, 40 years of the 18th century. And it's no wonder that a man was busy writing Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire, Edward Gibbon. I'm surprised he didn't go on to write Decline and Fall of the English Society. He could easily have done so. Now what stopped England from having a revolution? Why did the poor not rise? Why wasn't there a complete turning upside down of society? What stopped England going through the turmoil that America went through, that France went through? What was the factor here that altered the course of our history? The, the fact is that during this century, God turned on the hot tap. And I'm finished with all the cold stuff and the intellectual stuff now. God turned on a breath of revival. God, through his Holy Spirit, did the most amazing things in this land of ours from which we are still benefiting. Now, God's method is always this, to choose a personality and to fill that personality with his Holy Spirit and enable them to do it. This has always been God's method. It's very rarely that God has worked through committees or larger groups of people. His method is always to raise up men to do the job. And it always will be that. And as long as those men remain in the relationship to Christ that they should be, there is no harm in that. But God has chosen to use personalities. And through the 18th century, time and again, God raised up personalities. For those of you from Wales, he raised up Howell Harris and Griffith Jones and Daniel Rowlands during this century. And they changed the course of Welsh history. For those of you from America, it was in this century that he raised up, now let me get it right, Theodore Frelinghuysen. Have I said it rightly? And he in turn influenced the great preacher Jonathan Edwards and that great man David Brainerd, the great man of prayer who went as a missionary to the Indians and who died after only three years, but who changed American history. These men were raised up and it is estimated that in the 18th century in America alone, 300,000 people were led to the Lord. And considering the population then, that's quite a revival with the camp meetings flourishing at the end of the century. But the two countries I want to talk to you about are first of all Germany and then England because they're closely related. And I want to talk to you about a man whom God raised up in Germany called the Count von Zinzendorf. You've got some of his hymns in this hymn book here. And Count von Zinzendorf had a huge estate in Saxony called Herrnhut. And to that estate there came one day some beggars. They were worshippers of the Lord Jesus Christ. They were the remains of the church of John Huss in Bohemia. And still centuries after John Huss, they, they met simply around the Lord Jesus Christ. And they'd been turned out of their country and they came to von Zinzendorf. 
and he had been converted a short time before and he said come on in you can have my estate and you can build houses here and I'll protect you and together we'll build up a Christian community and they did and they called it the Moravian community and they were the first real missionary society in Europe there had been other attempts at missionary work but that little group of Moravians sent out no less than 25 missionaries in the first few years of their life to take the gospel of Christ to the utmost parts of the earth. They went to America, they came to England. There's a Moravian church just below the Crystal Palace. Sorry, um, what's the one in North London? Alexandria Palace that I've often uh, visited and there it lies, the Moravian church. You'll find Moravians here and there in this country and in America and throughout the world. But it was Count von Zinzendorf who started that and he was to have a profound influence on England through a friend of his. More of that in a moment. Now I come, by the way, if you want to know the hymns of Count von Zinzendorf, Jesus still lead on till our rest be won. You've sung that? And here's another, Jesus thy blood and righteousness. Count von Zinzendorf once said this, I have only one passion, it is Jesus. And that sums up his life. No wonder he was the great man he was. Now I come to England and our beloved land here and ask, how did God turn the, the hot tap on here? How did he raise the spiritual temperature here? Well, the answer is he did it through individuals again. The first man he laid his hand on was a young man working his way through Oxford by cleaning the shoes of the students. And his name, George Whitfield. And God laid his hand on that young man. A young man who was going places, a young man who was a hard worker, a disciplined young man. But God said, George Whitfield, you're a sinner and you need salvation. And through a great spiritual struggle, George Whitfield came to know the Lord Jesus Christ and he began to preach. A year after his conversion, he was preaching. I forget where, but I know his first text. It was 2 Corinthians 5.17, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. He preached it at Gloucester. And when he preached that sermon, he said this, which mortally offended most of his hearers. He said, I do not care if you've been baptized. I do not care if you've had water on your forehead in the name of the Trinity. He said, you must be born again. He said, I've got the new birth. And he said, I want you to have it. And when he finished preaching, 17 people were born again. And that was the beginning. He was soon preaching to 30 and 40,000 people at once. He not only travelled England, he went to Scotland, preached to 40,000 in Edinburgh. And then he crossed the Atlantic 13 times. Died in America at the end, but he was preaching everywhere he could go. And George Whitfield was one of the greatest servants of God England has seen. The tragedy is that most of his work disappeared after his death because he never organised follow-up for his converts. The only person who really urged him to start churches, in a sense, was the Countess of Huntingdon. And if ever you've seen a church with over the door the Countess of Huntingdon connection, you're going back to the days of that lady who supported George Whitfield. But when he died, he said, I feel my work has been a rope of sand and will disappear very quickly. And in fact, it has done. And you don't hear of any Whitfieldites. You don't hear of any groups today, except that Countess of Huntingdon Connection Church and one or two other small groups. But nevertheless, he led thousands to the Lord. I don't mean that they fell away. I mean that they found their way into other churches. <laughs> now, the other great man, and here I'm going to town, and somebody told me they expected to be here two hours tonight because of this next man. Well, I assure you, you're not going to be. But I must talk about this man. Uh, he's one of my great heroes, and that's the man John Wesley. And... Uh, more of that in a moment. The story begins in the little village in Lincolnshire where my wife and I were married, Epworth. We were married in the Wesley Memorial Church. The minister who conducted the wedding was the warden of the old rectory, which is still there and which was the home of the Wesley family. And so there in that rectory something happened and something new was born, away up in the rather depressing flat country of Lincolnshire on that little island that just rises up for Epworth. Now, 
John Wesley's grandparents had been independents, which explains a great deal, but his parents were both Anglican by conviction. And they were there as the vicar and his wife of that little town of Epworth. Now we need to study the parents. Samuel Wesley was quite an amazing man, a bit of a poet. He spent most of his years writing a poem on Job, which was never really popular, but he passed on to his sons a poetic gift. But the mother was the amazing woman, old Susanna Wesley. She had 19 children, 12 of whom she reared. And she trained them not to cry after they were one year old. And when they were five, she taught them to read until by the end of their first week, they could read Genesis 1. How much they understood, I don't know. And how she did it, I don't know. No initial training alphabet, none of your modern toys and other things to help them. She gave one hour a week to each child to help them grow spiritually. And when you study the life of Susanna Wesley, you've studied the beginning of Methodism, for that's what was to come. When John, or Jackie as she called him, was seven years old, the rectory was on fire and they got all the children out, bar one, Jackie, little John. Those of you who have seen the film will remember the dramatic moment when they saw him at the upstairs window and how the villagers climbed on each other's backs to rescue him. And she clutched him to her bosom and said, you're a brand plucked from the burning. And she believed from then that John would be her greatest son. And so he was. He went to Charterhouse School, then to Oxford, to join his brother Charles. And there they formed what they called the Holy Club. And my it was, and it was offensive to everybody else too, as such a name might indicate. They got up at four in the morning to pray. They did their studies as students during the day. And then they visited the jail. And they had a dispensary to give medicine to sick people. And they were trying desperately to save themselves by being good. One member of the Holy Club was George Whitfield. And that's where their paths crossed. And this little group of students were desperately trying to get to heaven by being good. They still hadn't learned how you become a Christian. They were so methodical in the way they got up and went to the jail and did this, that and the other and kept accounts of all that they did that the students didn't call them the Holy Club but gave them a nickname, Methodists, they said, Methodists. And it was a term of abuse but the nickname stuck and has stuck to this very day. The time came when John realized that he still felt he wasn't doing enough for God, so he offered for the ministry as his father had before him and as his brother had before him. And John and Charles were ordained by the Archbishop of Canterbury, and they were now priests of the Church of England and were still not Christians. And because they knew this in their heart, they felt they weren't doing enough for God, so they volunteered to go out as missionaries to Georgia, to the Red Indians, and thought, surely if you go as a missionary... You get saved, and they went out to save their own souls. Now, could you get as far as that without being a Christian? Of course you can. And they did. And they were not only priests, they were missionaries. And they hadn't saved their own souls, and they were desperately trying to. On the way out, in the middle of the Atlantic, they struck a storm. And they were all frightened. They panicked, and they thought the end had come. They threw things overboard to lighten the ship, but it looked as if all was lost. But there in the middle of the ship were a group of people, quiet, calm, praying. Moravian refugees, Moravians from Hernhut, who knew Count von Zinzendorf. And John Wesley went up to them afterwards in his clergyman's garb, said, why weren't you afraid? And they said, why should we be? And one of them began to ask him about his soul and said, do you know that Jesus is your saviour? And this clergyman, John Wesley, replied, I know he is the saviour of the world, but do you know that he is your saviour? And John Wesley said yes, but in his diary that night he admitted it was a lie and said, I go to Georgia to save my own soul. How can I save the souls of the Indians? He came back to London after three miserable years of failure and wondered what he should do. His brother came back too, an equal failure, but praise God, God had someone waiting in London for them, a man called Peter Berler, another Moravian from Count Zinzendorf. And Peter Berler got hold of them and he talked to them. And one never-to-be-forgotten Sunday, John Wesley went to St. Paul's Cathedral to worship for Sunday morning. 
And as he read his Bible that morning, he opened his Bible and he read these words, Thou art not far from the kingdom of God. And that night he went to a little meeting of the Moravian Germans in Aldersgate Street. There's a Barclays Bank there now, but they put a plate on the bank to show where it took place. And in Aldersgate Street on May the 24th, 1738, he went to the meeting. And they read aloud Luther's commentary on Romans. I wonder how many people would stand much of that in church today, reading a commentary on Romans aloud for some hours. But when the clock said a quarter to nine at night, John Wesley says this. He said, I felt my heart strangely warmed. I felt I did trust Christ, that he had saved me from my sins, even mine. Saved me from the law of sin and death. And an assurance was given him in that moment that he, he really was a forgiven sinner. Now here he was, a failed missionary, ordained priest in the Church of England. He had done all those good things for other people, and yet he didn't know his sins were forgiven. That's what happens when you try to save yourself. Because you're putting your trust in what you do instead of what Christ does. And this was the one thing he couldn't learn. Well, by the way, my little boy is called Richard Wesley because he was born at quarter to nine on Sunday evening, as well as the fact that he was born in Lincolnshire, not far from Epworth, and that his old dad thought a lot of John Wesley. But at quarter to nine it started. Now, he went almost straight away out to Germany to visit von Zinzendorf, and he came back with many of the hymns, and he translated them into English, but he came back wanting to preach the gospel, and preach it he did. The pulpits closed to him. Every time he preached in the Church of England, they told him after the service, that's your first and last visit here. And so he finally was in a position where he couldn't preach. And then George Whitfield said to him, John, will you come and preach in the open air? And John Wesley thought it was the most dreadful thing in the world for an ordained clergyman not to preach from a pulpit. But then he remembered that Christ preached a sermon on the mount. And he said, well, if Christ could preach on a mountain, so can I. And he went down to Kingswood, outside Bristol, to the miners, and he preached. And as he preached, he describes in his journal how the tears made little white rivers down their black cheeks. And John Wesley realized that God was calling him to the same ministry as George Whitfield, who was now leaving for America. And he took up the threads of George Whitfield's preaching. That was on, in April 1739 that he began open-air preaching. Mind you, he had opposition. There were times when he was dragged by the hair through the streets, and, as in the Wensbury riot, riots. But in 50 years, he traveled quarter of a million miles on horseback. With a Bible in his hand and a horse between his knees, he would ride into a village and preach. And this is how he preached. He would begin by preaching the Ten Commandments. And he would preach the law, the law by which every man and woman will be judged. And he would go on preaching the law for days until people began to look unhappy, until they began to look troubled. Then when he realized that they were beginning to realize they were sinners, he says in his diary, I began to mix a bit of the love of God with the law of God, and a bit more and a bit more, until finally I was preaching the gospel of the love of God. Now Wesley discovered that you cannot preach the love of God till you preach the law. That there's no point in preaching a saviour until you preach sin. What comfort can a saviour bring to those who never felt their woe? That was written all over his ministry. Mind you, it was an unusual and curious sight to see a Church of England clergyman still with all his vestments, standing in the middle of a village green, preaching like that. They'd never seen anything like it. But he went to the working men. His three centres were London, Bristol, Newcastle. And all over that triangle you'll find places where Wesley preached. His last sermon was preached at Leatherhead in Surrey. And there's a tablet on the town hall now, which I showed my father just a few weeks ago. Not only did he preach everywhere on the principle, as he said, that the world is my parish, and there may be a little element of truth in that he was helped in his travels by an unhappy marriage, and kept on the move. That was the only real shadow over his life. But there are many who felt that felt grateful for it, that he was traveling. But he traveled and he traveled and he preached and he preached. Seven times a day was normal. Not only did he preach, he wrote. 
and he published books and pamphlets, he started schools and orphanages, he opened dispensaries, he was the first to use electric treatment for rheumatism with a machine which you can see in City Road today in his house and they've discovered it produces enough electricity to kill a man but he used it for rheumatism. <laughs> He was a most varied man, but quite obviously, it soon became apparent that he couldn't do all this himself. And the trouble was that he had few clergymen to do it with him. So his mother came up with the idea. He, she said, what about unordained preachers, lay preachers, local preachers who would not go around as you do, but preach locally? And one of the very first team of six was John Pawson. And his wife, Frances, is one of the leading uh, Methodist women of that day. So I suppose our tribal association goes way back to the beginning. And so with a team, John Wesley's reply to his mother, give me a hundred such men will set England on fire. And they did. And when he died, there were 80,000 people meeting in fellowship as the result of his travels. Now, he did not do what George Whitfield did, or at least he did do what George Whitfield didn't. When they were converted, he built them up into fellowships, largely because the local churches wouldn't have them. And so he would build them into, not churches, but he called them societies, Methodist societies. And he gave them class leaders whose job it was to lead them spiritually. And then he had, we'll say, so many societies in a district, and he called that district a circuit because a local preacher could go round the circuit on horseback once a month and preach in every place. So he made the horse circuits round which the local preachers travelled. And this kind of machinery is still used today, though I, I think it's very ill-adapted to the 20th century. For horseback, it's a very good idea. And for the kind of setting in which he was, it was an ideal piece of organisation. So he built them into an organisation, and that means that, of course, they kept the Methodists, and they still have done. Now, of course, bear in mind that all this time, John Wesley was a Church of England clergyman. What did they think about him? Well, I'm afraid they thought very badly about him, especially when he ordained ministers for America. And though he never left the Church of England, it was quite obvious that as soon as he died, the Methodist societies would become Methodist churches, and this they did, and the split came as soon as he died. But I think John Wesley was to blame, or at least was the man who did all that needed to be done to separate. And I like the remark of someone who said John Wesley was like a man rowing a boat, kept his face on the, towards the Church of England, but every pull of his oars took him further from it. That's precisely what he did. And so we are left at the end of the 18th century with a very large group of Methodists, in addition to the Anglicans, in addition to the Presbyterians and the Congregationals and the Baptists and the Friends. And by the end of the century, Roman Catholics were allowed back in too. So we're beginning to get the kind of picture we live in. Now I must leave John Wesley. Sorry to be so long about him, but you can understand why. May I now look at one other great man of this century, right at the end of it. In the year 1799, there came a young dissolute student to Cambridge by name Charles Simeon, hunting, shooting, fishing, gay young man. And when he came to Cambridge, he came face to face with his own life. And he had a spiritual struggle, and out of it he came to a sense of forgiveness. As he put it, I laid my sins on the head of Jesus. He was shortly ordained to the ministry, and at the early age of 23 went as vicar to Holy Trinity Church, where it was my privilege to preach a month ago. And there in the vestry, you can see his teapot, his umbrella, uh, pictures of him, Charles Simeon. And Charles Simeon preached, and the church was thronged. And he had a tremendous influence on the students. It was from his congregation that that young man, Henry Martin, went out to die in Persia as one of the greatest missionaries there's ever been. And Charles Simeon must be put in the great list of heroes of this century. But now let me finally just list some of the practical things that came out of this. I know it's all very well for people to say this kind of thing, and they say it here, they still say it. What's the point of all this gospel preaching and this hymn singing? What we need is people who get on and make the world a better place. And all this hot gospeling and all this ranting, it doesn't do anybody any good. May I say the 18th century gives the lie to that. The results 
of this revival in the 18th century were most practical, and I just want to give you five, very simply. The first is one that the world wouldn't appreciate, but which Christians have appreciated ever since. The century burst into song. I have mentioned Isaac Watts. Think of some of his famous hymns. I'll praise my maker. O oh God, our help in ages past. When I survey the wondrous cross, Jesus shall reign where'er the sun. Come, let us join our cheerful songs. Sweet is the work, my God, my King. I'm not ashamed to own my Lord. Give me the wings of faith to rise. You've sung those hymns. What about Philip Doddridge? Hark the glad sound, the Saviour comes. Of, o God of Bethel, by whose hand, O happy day that fixed my choice. What about Cowper? God moves in a mysterious way. There is a fountain filled with blood. Jesus, where'er thy people meet, sometimes a light surprises. What about Newton? How sweet the name of Jesus sounds. Glorious things of thee are spoken. Begone, unbelief. And the end of that verse, with Christ in the vessel, we smile at the storm. And above all, Charles Wesley. Back we go to the Wesley family. But Charles Wesley wrote 6,000 hymns. And he wrote them for every conceivable occasion. Two that spring to my mind, which are two of the most wonderful, are one, when a young person leaves home for the first time, hears a hymn for them to sing. Another is for a woman in child labor, and it's a most beautiful hymn centering her thoughts on the Lord for her to sing while she's bringing forth her children. And these are the hymns he wrote. 6,000, he would write them on horseback. He would arrive at a house and say, don't speak to me, give me a pen and paper quick. And he would write down, and out would come a hymn. We're going to finish this service with a hymn he wrote when he was one year old, spiritually. And on his first birthday, the anniversary of his conversion, Peter Berler, the Moravian German, said to Charles Wesley, if I had a thousand tongues, I'd want to sing the praise of Christ. So down it came, oh, for a thousand tongues to sing my great Redeemer's praise. And you'll sing it in a moment. Look at some of his others. Ye servants of God, your master proclaim. Hark the herald angels sing. Christ the Lord is risen today. Rejoice, the Lord is king. Come, Holy Ghost, our hearts inspire. Lord, from whom all blessings flow. And can it be that I should gain? Jesus, lover of my soul, a charge to keep I have. Soldiers of Christ, arise. O thou who camest from above, love divine, all loves excelling. O for a heart to praise my God, gentle Jesus, meek and mild. You'll find in every hymn book, most hymns, more hymns are by Charles Wesley than any other writer, with Isaac Watts a good second. And the last one I want to mention, the hymn writer, was Montgomery. And we're going to sing one of his hymns at communion as one of the devotional hymns. This century was a century of song, and when people get saved, they want to sing. And there's never been a century like it for hymn singing, and our hymn books are full of them. Result number two, Sunday schools. Now, if I asked you who started Sunday schools, I wonder who you'd tell me. If you know anything, you'd probably say Robert Rakes in Gloucester, and I tell you, you're wrong. Sunday schools were started by Hannah Ball in High Wycombe, a Methodist lady who lies buried in Stoken Church graveyard, and I took my father to see the grave when he visited us a week or two ago. And Hannah Ball started Sunday schools in a disused furniture factory in High Wycombe. And she did so as the result of a correspondence with John Wesley. And it was Hannah Ball who suggested to Robert Rakes, why don't you do the same? And the extraordinary thing is that there's a statue of Robert Rakes in Gloucester that says founder of Sunday schools. Well, he copied the idea from a woman, so there you are. That's one for the fairer sex. But Hannah Ball, go and see her grave round the right-hand side of the church as you go into Stoke and Church Graveyard. She started Sunday schools, and Robert Rakes took them up in 1780 in Gloucester. But she was doing it some years before that. And I picked up a book the other day on uh, early Methodist women, and it had next door to each other Francis Pawson and Hannah Ball. And uh, my father went home with that book too. Well, now, the third thing that happened was social righteousness. When people get converted, they put society right. And here are some of the things that followed. Poor relief began. Dispensaries distributing free medicine began. Orphanages began. Schools began. Prison reform. John Howard's work in prison reform goes directly back to the revival of the 18th century. And above all, the outstanding example is William Wilberforce and his fight with slavery. The last letter that John Wesley wrote was to William Wilberforce urging him to complete the fight.
And if ever you go to Kingston upon Hull, go to the William Wilberforce Museum. That came out of the revival. The fourth thing that came out was a tremendous spread of good literature. The Religious Tract Society was a direct result. So was the British and Foreign Bible Society. So were the commentaries of that great Bible teacher, Thomas Scott. But the final one I want to mention, and with this I close, missionary societies began, and the influence of Britain on the world for good spread. Now there had been some attempts at missionary work before, but it was at the end of the 18th century as the result of the rise in temperature that it really got going. And it was, of course, in 17, let me get the date right, 92. I should know that off by heart, but I don't. That the Baptist Missionary Society was formed. It was a Baptist who really set it going. A cobbler from Northampton constructing a globe of the world out of offcuts of leather and praying for that world, and particularly for India. And it was that Northampton cobbler converted, encouraged to be a preacher in the Baptist churches of Northamptonshire who with a group of others met one day in Kettering in 1792 and took a collection, a famous collection of 13 pounds, two and sixpence, which was quite a lot in those days, and started the Baptist Missionary Society. A year later, they were on their way to India to begin the great missionary work that followed. That was 1792. Three years later, 1795, the Anglicans, the Congregationals and the Presbyterians, not to be outdone, got together and started the London Missionary Society, the LMS, which sent out Morrison to China, Livingston to Africa and many another famous missionary. In 1796, not to be left behind, the Methodists founded the General Methodist Missionary Society, whose headquarters are now in Marylebone Road. In 1799, the Anglicans decided to have one of their own and the Church Missionary Society was started. And it was just in this period that the British and Foreign Bible Society started, all at the end of the century. And this was the direct result of the evangelical revival of the 18th century. Who says that hot gospeling has no results? Who says that the world isn't changed because people get excited about the Lord? The 18th century, the one lesson I draw out of the whole century for you tonight is this. What a man believes will affect his behavior. Cold intellectualism, bad morals, hot gospel, and all this follows. And somebody has said that the early Methodists were like a cluster of chaste snowdrops growing on a foul rubbish heap. If you want to understand the Methodist emphasis, are not drinking or gambling, you must understand that the tradition goes back to reality in the 18th century and that they had to insist on that to get a man anywhere near the Lord. But they fought that and they cleaned England up. And a historian in France has said that if you want to understand why the French Revolution and the enthronement of reason and the anarchy that followed did not spread to England, you must study the life of the Reverend John Wesley. That's an amazing tribute. God had his answer. And where man's cold reason saying you've got to prove anything before you believe it was killing religion dead. And when you kill religion, you kill morals. When people say no God, they'll say no goodness. God raised up men who pointed to revelation, who pointed to God giving us knowledge that science can neither prove nor disprove and preached the gospel of supernatural miracle and a living God who could step in and change a life and change a society. That neither nature nor human nature was governed by laws, but that both were governed by God and that God could turn both to his eternal purposes. That's the message I want to bring you tonight. And it's a message that we all need to learn. Great men of God, got them warmed up again and brought the gospel of Jesus Christ to this land. And we still benefit from the effects of that revival 200 and more years ago. Let us pray. O oh God, our Father, there is one prayer in all our hearts. Do it again, Lord. You are still the same God. Your arm is not shortened that you are not able to save today. We pray that in the decline of our society, with things on every hand that disturb us, 
with the revival even of those that immoral literature of the 18th century again on the screen. With all this, Lord, do it again. Raise up men who will be fearless to preach Christ. Raise up such an army of evangelists and men and women on fire for the Lord that this country again may resound to the ring of the gospel and we may see again an influence go out from this nation for good in the whole of the rest of the world. O oh God, you have blessed us greatly in the past, but we cannot live in the past. We must live now. And we pray that in our day and generation, we too may discover the forgiveness of sins in Christ Jesus and then go out to tell others of the love that can forgive them. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.